Well, thank you um, for those instructions. Um, welcome to the Tuesday afternoon plenary session. We have a wonderful speaker today. Um, I am Janelle Curlin from Georgia State University in the US, and I'll be chairing this session. Um, Johanna Meyer is here with us from, um, largely from the Herty School of Business in Berlin, um, where she's on the faculty there. She also spends um, some of her time at Stanford University, where she is the academic editor of the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Um, and many of you have probably read her work. She's um, published a number of groundbreaking articles and um, other publications. Um, involving social enterprise, and so we are privileged to hear her speak today on um, her typology of um, social entrepreneuring models. So I w we will leave some time at the end for discussion, so if you have some questions, please, please save those to the end, and we'll um, take those at that time. And with that, I will turn it over to Johanna. Thank you, Janelle, and it's very humbling, actually, to come after you because I, uh, one of my dreams is still kind of to be in a session where I can discuss your work or you discuss my work, but we will get there. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it is equally humbling to be here today for me, and uh, it is really with great gratitude to, to the organizers and the founders of AMS. Um, big thank you for having me here today. Uh, the humbling thing comes in when I, 11 years ago, started to do research on social entrepreneurship, and I decided to focus at that time very much on developing countries. I couldn't really find anything that was close to what I would consider as, you know, living up to expectations that you, at that time I was a junior faculty member, that the expectations that I would have in terms of being meaningful and yet rigorous work. And the only piece of, you know, the, the, the stream or, or body of research that I found was actually uh, the work by Amos at that time, the 2001 uh, book. Obviously, that was very much focusing on, on Europe, so I, I went to kind of on my own. And um, for me, social entrepreneurship, apart from the more personal passion, and apart from my belief that it w is important to bring content related to social enterprise to the curriculum that we teach at business school, my ambition was really to also show that uh, there is social entrepreneurship as a context, as a setting for studies, is an incredible, powerful, and important setting for us to re interrogate our theories that we so easily uh, adopt to push and finally also and ultimately also to advance existing theories because not only have especially the theories and perspective that we use in management have been mainly kind of applied or tested in more Western societies, but also very much kind of at least in the last 20 to 30 years in more the private sector. So for me personally, um, social entrepreneurship was always an, an incredible opportunity to, for us as scholars uh, interested in, again, in more kind of in the pushing and advancing existing theories. The work that I was asked, and, and Benjamin asked me to present this particular piece, uh, the work that I present today is a joint work with my colleague Julie Batilana at Harvard Business School and Julian Cardenas, who is a faculty member at the University of Antioquia in Medellin in Colombia. This is a piece of work that, again, in the same spirit as much of my other work tries to also understand how can it speak to existing bits and pieces to theoretical claims. But it's also a piece that probably more than others is less standalone for its theoretical contribution, but more so uh, also intentionally uh, been written in order to you know, give rise or inspire a new set of questions. And this is why I would love to come back to also uh, Janelle's uh, offer to have a conversation, a discussion uh, after I present here. 
in a way, one of the sources of inspiration for this piece comes from Chick Perot, who reminded <laughs> us that we need a more focused investigation away from society of organizations towards organizing for uh, society. Just in a nutshell, and this is after lunch, so kind of you get the, the gist of the paper in one slide. This paper is about unpacking this heterogeneity that we kind of observe in the field of practice of social entrepreneuring. It tries to come up with a, a practical but also theoretically meaningful typology. A typology that, yes, consists of stylized, more ideal type of types, but yet it's very much empirical anchored. So the more kind of rigorous people would say, well, isn't it then in a taxonomy? Well, it is an empirically derived uh, typology. And uh, the, the way we interpreted the, the four types that come out of our empirical uh, investigation out of the cluster analysis, we interpret them as four different models that leverage very different types, forms of capital. Political capital, human capital, economic capital, and social capital. The next kind of level uh, that we add here, we also identify that each of these mo models is anchored in a distinct, in distinct principles, and not so distinct, I will come to that, uh, principles that provide anchors for judgment, but also anchors for, for action taking. And again, look at this as a piece that is supposed to actually spur and inform further research, empirical and theoretical research in this domain. So just to start off, I just give you briefly a little sense of how we look at, how we view social entrepreneurship in this particular paper. I'm not a big fan of the one and only definition of, of social entrepreneurship, but I do think that it is important for us as scholars, as researchers, for a particular research project to be very explicit about what we mean in that particular study about it. So in, our, in this particular case, I would like to emphasize also that social enter entrepreneurship as uh, we use it in this paper, refers to opportunities and activities that leverage economic activity to pursue a social objective and also to uh, implement uh, social change. So why do I emphasize that? Because the focus on economic activity allows us to differentiate it as a phenomena from, let's say, social movement or from philanthropy initiative. At the same time, the transformative ambition, the focus on social change, allows, it, allows us to differentiate it from you know, well-intended uh, and what colleague Vazi uh, called entrepreneurship with a conscience or from CSR. And it's exactly this, this particular angle of, of um, or this aspect of transformative power, the focus on on social change not as a byproduct, but the, the very essence of the initiative that encouraged us to actually also speak to other upcoming concepts that have been developed in the management uh, theories uh, throughout the last years, and especially in within entrepreneurship literature, the concept of entrepreneuring has been uh, used typically more from a theoretical perspective to actually emphasize this particular transformative aspect. So we, we deliberately also wanted to adopt that concept and do talk about social entrepreneurial, entrepreneuring models in our work. In other words, because uh, to, to say that we also wanted to, with an empirical study, to add to that particular uh, stream of work that has been largely been more conceptual. Now, if we think, put ourselves in the shoes of a social entrepreneur, how do you go about uh, coming up with an initiative and an approach? Where do you start? What do social entrepreneurs do? How they, what are the first stages, if you will, 
uh, to think about a model. And again, a very explicitly focusing here, not at the organization, but at a model. A model, an entrepreneuring model that basically captures uh, a specific initiative and approach. How do you go about that? Well, very often that process starts with actually interpreting and or reinterpreting uh, a particular social problem that is out there has not been addressed effectively or uh, efficiently by another actor. And uh, this is a process that we label conceptualizing, very much kind of parallel to a process that has been, you, uh, been described in more institutional, organizational uh, theory as a process of theorization. And this process of conceptualizing is composed of two particular sub-processes. Processes. One is specifying the initiative, and one is justifying the initiative. And I will come back to that in a second. The overall goal with this kind of focus on a model is to, and this is also something that uh, the concept entrepreneur in, in uh, revolves to, that it uh, alludes to, it's not just to focus on static kind of structural issue of an organization, but really get down to the, to the the nuts and bolts to, to the issue of what is it that social enterprises, social entrepreneurial organizations do? What do they do? How do they do it? And why do they do it? So it's really this what, how, and why that we wanted to capture empirically. And there is also a long tradition in organizational theory that has looked at, at you know, the, the idea that we can use different or that we can capture different characteristics, features of organization in parallel, simultaneously. This is the con so-called configuration approach. And this is what we adopt in this particular paper in order to simultaneously look at what these organizations do, how they do it, and why do they do it. So if I now go, can briefly go into these two sub-processes of conceptualizing. First, specifying the, the model. Specifying the what and the how. Again, like social enter enterprises very often engage in this process to actually redefine or re-problematize a, a social problem. The reason why we are still with, stuck with poverty is because poverty is multidimensional, it's multifaceted. There is not just one linear solution to it. So also different social issues can be looked at and are interpreted, interpreted in very different ways. HIV in Africa, is that a, pro a health problem or is it an educational problem? So this how a social entrepreneur or social enterprise redefines a problem for us is something that is an important component of the entrepreneuring model. Second, identifying who are the target constituencies. In the early days of, of social enter entrepreneurship literature and also the more motivational literature on that, we put a lot of emphasis on the social entrepreneur. Well, we, we have deliberately stepped back from that uh, as we want to understand the entrepreneuring model and try to understand, okay, who is really the key actor here? Not so much the entrepreneur, but who is the lever, who is the key actor that makes change happening? Now that can be the beneficiary, but it doesn't have to be the beneficiary. So for example, again, like if you think about you solve, you address HIV in Africa, and you think education is a key lever, your key constituencies probably are the teachers. So you basically focus on teachers. 
So we here, we, in this particular dimensions, we try not so much to look at just the beneficiaries, sometimes they are the beneficiaries, and the social entrepreneur, but really the key constituency that needs to be involved in the initiatives to push through social change. And finally, the third dimension of a model that we try to empirically uh, capture is the activity set that the organization chooses. And again, here it is really the activity set geared towards this specific key actor, key constituency. Very often we talk uh, very colloquially about social enterprises as engaging in commercial activities and in social activities, but we don't dig deeper. So how do I exactly involve that teacher in Africa? Do I give that teacher training or do I do something else with them? Do I network the teachers in Africa in order that they become more the change agents uh, on the issue of HIV? So those are the three dimensions here that we, we try to get to, but do so in probably a more, um, definitely more time consuming way, and definitely not the straightforward just coding thing. First kind of, how do these organization define, interpret the particular problem? Whom do they need to have on board? Who are really their key constituencies? And finally, what are the particular activities that they want to engage the key constituencies with? So that's about how we conceptualize around the specifying the components of the model. The second component of conceptualizing relates to how do these organizations justify their actions? What are their principles of, you know, of creating value? What are their anchors for judgment, if you will? On this side, we rely on the work of Boltanski and Teveno. Some of you are very familiar with this uh, work, a theory on convention, that allows us to, to find also a vocabulary about the, the different rationales that social entrepreneurial organizations might adopt, but gets out, out away from this very kind of dichotomous way of looking at. It's either uh, a social or it's economic, and uh, so, in other words, for uh, Boltanski and Tevino, there exist th six orders of worth. Each kind of has a different connotation of what worth, where is value derived, and what would be typical actions to do. So very often we look at, in, if you look at this list here, we look at civic and market as the one that are relevant for social entrepreneurship. But don't we also forget about other value anchors? And this is why we thought of, you know, just to get started, we rely on their existing uh, typology, if you will, and try to see how that plays out uh, in our empirical uh, study. And finally, also, we chose uh, Boltanski and Teveno because there is wonderful work by uh, David Stark, a sociologist at Columbia, who has uh, very convincingly shown how Boltanski and Tivino is actually very meaningful also for entrepreneurship uh, 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 research. So, so far so good from the empirical side. So how do you do that uh, uh, now um, uh, uh, from the theoretical conceptual side, I would rather say, how do you uh, put that in, you know, an empirical research design. So what was important for us here when we decided, you know, had to decide, okay, what type of data are we going to look at? It was important that we get to the, the, the self-declaration of the model of the organization. So we needed something where basically the organizations themselves declared themselves, how they saw, basically how they perceive their own initiative. That was very important to us. We decided to stick to text that 
social entrepreneurial organization developed themselves. And there was an opportunity to actually use the text of the organizations that actually apply to become fellows to two of the very known support organizations. That's the Schwab Foundation and, and that Ashoka. This research has been done empirically already uh, quite a while ago, so at that time, the two of them were also the most established support organization. They are similar in the sense that they provide resources, different types of resources. They are similar in a way that uh, the, um, the social entrepreneurial organizations have to go through a, um, a process of being vetted and being endorsed. And in this process, they have to actually develop this, this text. Uh, the texts were pretty similar in the sense of the focus of the text, and also uh, they had to self-identify as social entrepreneurs. So for us, these texts were basically in a very sociological research tradition, an empirical window. There were uh, meaningful both uh, conceptually, theoretically, as I just explained, but also empirically because in a way it also allowed or will allow us to get a sense of where the field of social entrepreneurship as a practice is at the moment because these organizations that got selected by these two organizations actually are in a way very often associated with the field. So we, in a way, capture also a little bit the, the, the meaning of social entrepreneurship in the field. And uh, what I also want to, to stress here, the way we uh, approach this empirically, we um, go through different phases. The specifying the model, remember, it was about redefining the problem, issues, who needs to be involved, so basically which actors, and with what activities. That particular relationship that we consider a configuration very much kind of uh, resonates with an approach also that has been used by sociologist uh, Paul Di Maggio and also John Moore that have in previous work on in the third sector have also tried to assess relationship between issues, actors, and activities in order to understand the underlying meaning structures. So we very much try to also follow that uh, um, tradition. So to get to the, the entrepreneuring models, actors in a way, uh, actors, oh, whoa, whoa, really? Oh my God. <laughs> um, actors, activities, and issues, um, we do an um, um, a open-coded content analysis where we really try not to just kind of map initiatives on existing INCOP categories, but let the categories emerge from the data. We do a content analysis to get the, to the clusters. Uh, second, in order to get to the justifying the principles, we do use a closed coding approach, getting the, uh, interpret the text with respect to Boltanski and Tevino, and then relate the clusters uh, to that approach. So let me just kind of uh, move quickly here. This is the results from the content analysis, and uh, you will see that um, what we find is that uh, social entrepreneurial organizations to do 100 that we studies hardly kind of just kind of think about the problem domain in one issue but they typically think, it, think about it in multiple ways. Uh, similar here, you see uh, the, the list of uh, target constituencies and activities. Activities training was by far uh, the, most, um, the, the most performed activity. Also interesting to a lot of, of people who, who see in social entrepreneurship this purely market-based approach, communities as the main target uh, group. And I know Anna, Maria, and Helen will really like that, uh, that finding. Let me move quickly to the clusters that we find, and I really rush through here, because we don't have a lot of time. And again, like the way we, we looked at these clusters is we try to 
to understand configurations. And uh, it was relative, it was not something we had in mind before, but the uh, interpretation over and over of the data made it so clear that what actually kept the clusters together was that each cluster leveraged a different source of a uh, form of capital. So the political uh, capital, for example, uh, would be a, an exemplary, would be a, an organization in Africa that works on human rights and that, that does counseling and, and, and training for uh, both civil society organizations but also uh, victims of, of human rights in, in Africa. The human capital one, uh, an example would be Seoul City from South Africa that works in what they would call, consider edutainment, where they bring health and, and uh, environmental issues closer to the broader public by having TV shows, radio, and so on. The market, the economic capital, that's the usual uh, suspect like honey, honey care in Kenya would be an example. They provide microfinance and provide training for um, honey farmers, and finally, social capital uh, that is organization that deliberately bridge different uh, partners together, for example, in, in, in Taproot's case, uh, civil society organization and private companies. Just in a very, in a nutshell, how do these tip, do four different entrepreneuring models relate to anchors or orders of worth when you use uh, Wojtanski and Tivino. Well, there is one anchor that all of them actually used, and that's the, the industrial order of worth. And uh, just to remember, uh, the industrial one, worth is based on efficiency, productivity, productivity and operational effectiveness. Now this might not come as a surprise to you, but for us it was important to really kind of understand whether this is something that we typically associate, a lot of people associate with social entrepreneurship has come out throughout. The, the clusters, however, do very much differ in terms of the, the other, how they use the other orders uh, of worth, if you will. Also very much kind of uh, aligned uh, with uh, what we have seen. You see, see that here as well, the economic capital with uh, market, um, the political one with fame, the human capital fame and domestic, and uh, we have uh, the social capital with civic. Now, question. We controlled for geographies, we controlled for support organization. Not surprisingly, you have an effect from the uh, support organizations, uh, the way they select certain uh, um, social entrepreneurial organization. The Schwab Fellows very much kind of differentiated by a market, uh, by the economic um, capital and uh, political and social capital in the case of Ashoka. Interesting, uh, there was no kind of significant differences across geographies. Could obviously be that this population, these 200 social entrepreneurial organizations really represent more this global field of, of, of social entrepreneurship. Uh, so uh, again, like in terms of findings, I don't need to spend a lot of time here. Uh, you saw the findings. What I would like to actually end close with is this slide that basically lays out a little bit of a future agenda that hopefully our uh, study will encourage people. And here I really refer also to young people, PhD students, junior faculty that really are the hope in this area. Uh, to do uh, more research, insightful research. This is a very cross-sectional uh, piece that I presented to you. What is really interesting, what ex excites me is to understand how does this affect trajectories of social entrepreneurial organizations over time? Do they move from one, from one uh, way of organizing to another one during their lifetime? Also, uh, the combination of models. Are combination of these models possible? When we, do, we talk a lot about hybrids these days, how would you know, hybridity be kind of look like if we take into consideration combination of that, those models? Uh, 
uh, again, like I think it, the, the study is also obviously says quite a bit about these two support organizations, so about the state uh, of the field of, of social entrepreneurship as we perceive it as a field of practice, or at least some people perceive it as a field of practice. But finally, uh, we hope that this study informs uh, theory and practice in the following way. If you think about the, the different forms of capital that are leveraged, uh, you know, the immediate thing is like, whoa, aren't they different in terms of level of analysis? And that's relevant for, for me as a practitioner, but for me as a scholar as well. Where do I study it or where do I try to understand where my impact is? And at the same time here, the time dimension. If you are an organization that tries to lever political capital, when is it, in what time span do you expect impact to happen? I think so both these two levels of analysis and in terms of time dimension, in terms of when you expect in these days when everybody kind of asks where is your outcome, where is your impact, when is it really that you see the fruits of your social change initiatives coming through. So we hope that this provides a, a more fine-grained understanding that might hopefully also be valuable uh, to uh, practitioners in Thank you. And yet the ratings for it inspired was particularly <laughs> low. <laughs> and uh, I, just wa I just wondered whether um, you had any thoughts on that, because uh, the these are often organizations and which have come into being <laughs> or whatever, and they're <laughs> not ones that have been around for 20 or 30 years. I think that's an excellent um, a question. And, and there is obviously a bias in this, is this data in a way that uh, the text that you that we have analyzed has been developed while they were going through the, the vetting process of being endorsed. So in a way, if, I, if we had asked Ashoka Fellows to, to give us some text in the very beginning when they even entered, you know, the, the, with the first step into the doors of Ashoka, probably text would be a little bit kind of all over the place or perhaps reflect a little bit more the inspirational one. But throughout the process, and they also had to kind of, were, were tasked to be explicit about what the intervention is and so on. <laughs> Probably that, there was a little bit more of a systematic approach to it, and that perhaps explains that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, our also, we, again, we deliberately didn't want to also leave it at the level of the entrepreneur, but really try to understand what is it they are doing, how they are doing it, and why would they, can we get something out of the, the data that allows us to speculate of why would they, what are the, the, the orders of worth at play. Yes, exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Short, medium, and large. How many years? How many years? To be honest with you, I think you have to take into consideration the issue domain someone works with. There are simply some, some organizations that work on, you know, in terms of education. When do you, of course you can assess an impact in a more kind of medium term. But, you know, very often, if you really think about social change and societal change, 
it might be more valuable to, to, to assess the real impact, and we kind of use this term impact now so kind of casually. Then I think it, it, you, you talk about a long time. But I would be very hesitant, the same as I'm hesitant with uh, advising impact investors or so to be kind of, you know, say in three years you have to show those outcomes and if possible impact. That's a little bit where I'm, I'm very kind of getting nervous. So. And in advocacy political capital, it's even more difficult now. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it's a, a real great starting point, but it, it sort of, for me, I remember it just it holds that question so hard. Yes, no, I'm, I'm with you, and you know, I'm the, the most critical person of just using Ashoka or just using Schwab. Uh, 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 data in order to say some, when you claim to say something about social entrepreneurship. In our case, actually, it was beneficial because we wanted to exactly the self-declaration. And we could control that in both kind of populations, they actually were at similar stages when they said that. And I also, I have the same experience as you, Andrea. I, I've seen kind of probably that helped me to go through this selection uh, processes in order to see for what, for which studies is this data actually uh, a good data or not? And I hear again, I would never claim that this is um, these are f entrepreneurial models that represent the whole kind of universe and are rob robust. But I think that it's a starting point that allows us to to get get our you know get more appetite for actually empirically developing types because we have had a number of typologies in this area but most of those typologies are actually um, conceptual ones uh, engaging previous theories on entrepreneurship and applying it to social entrepreneurship and um, in my case it was you know my deep appreciation of some of the work in sociology that has been done in terms of trying to to uh, uncover meaning structures uh, in a relational way that has, um, has encouraged us to try this out. But it's a starting point, you're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you.